Objectivity is a myth. It just is a myth. It's not possible for you to be objective, given the way your brain works. Right now, we're at this profound moment in history where, on the one hand, we've never been more interconnected as a species because of technology. You and I are thousands of miles apart and having this conversation with uh, hundreds of other people around the world right now who are listening into this. So what is what's going on in the world right now? What does it mean for the world of work and for our species? That's a big question, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, if you and I were in the same room um, and we liked each other, our first impressions were good, uh, or if we knew each other for a while and we trusted each other, our heart rates would synchronize, our breathing would synchronize. Actually, our heart rates would synchronize because our breathing would synchronize. Our physical movements might start to synchronize a little bit, you know? So if you put your hand on your chin, I put my, might put my hand on my cheek. If you crossed your ankles, I might cross my legs. You know, um, without being in the same place, we lose some of that communication capacity. Those, some of those channels are, are lost. But on Zoom, for example, we can still get some of them because we can still see each other's movements and we can hear the, the prosody of the changes in tone in each other's voices. And actually our brains can still pick up some information about mm -hmm. um, physical signals. Now think about, you know, we're on the telephone instead of being, you know, on Zoom. Now you've lost a bunch of information and you, but you still have the person's voice and you have their words. Or think about text. Now all you have are their words. So words and voice and face and other body movements and other physical signaling, all of these actually are ways that one human nervous system can impact another. And some modalities leave more room for ambiguity um, than others. And so it's incumbent upon us to fill in the gaps uh, so that uh, the other person's brain doesn't do it uh, and guess wrong. If I cut you off in mid-sentence, that could be because I'm rude or it could be because I'm really enthusiastic about what you're saying or it could be that we're having a problem with the connection because a satellite moved somewhere, right? And so it's all about what are the meanings of the sensory cues in a particular situation. Everyone knows Zoom fatigue and everyone realizes, I think, who is interacting on a regular basis with other people um, over, over electronic means that it's a, it's a blessing and, it's, and it's, it's remarkable, right? Um, but it also has costs associated with it fatigue-wise um, that other forms may not and one of the reasons is there's just a lot of ambiguity a lot more ambiguity in the mm. signals that are, are harder to resolve let's bring some of this into the arena of of our mission at indeed which is helping people get jobs let's jump to the other side of of that uh, interaction which is employers interviewing candidates and in doing that um, employers are attempting to assess another human being for their character and capability in some purely objective way. Uh, your work suggests that we are not well suited or maybe even capable of true objectivity. And one of the examples you cite um, is the, the famous 2011 study of judges in Israel of how affect can, a cloud, uh, can cloud rational judgment. Can you talk a little bit about this and how it might relate to what's happening in an interview process? Objectivity is a myth. It just is a myth. It's not possible for you to be objective, given the way your brain works. Your brain is always making guesses in advance of everything that happens based on your past experience. So you, your actions and your experience are conditioned on your past. The findings of this study are that when judges are um, feeling unpleasant um, right before lunch, they give harsher sentences than um, uh, you know they do um, at the beginning of the day uh, or when they're not hungry, basically. There are findings like this um, about the weather. If you interview for a job or like a position in, in a professional school on a rainy day, 
you are at a disadvantage because people feel mm -hmm. worse on rainy days than they do on sunny days. And in, I think one of the estimates was something like it costs you some number of points on your MCAT. You know, I think the important thing to understand, again, is that, you know, your brain is constantly tracking the sensory conditions. It's modeling the sensory conditions of the body, but it doesn't know really what's going on inside your body. It can't know. It just It's just getting the consequences of the changes. And it has to guess at what the causes are based on prior, based on your prior experience. As an employer, and like many employers, we recognize the importance of diversity in the workforce. We've all seen the same social and economic research that suggests that diverse teams are more creative, they're more innovative, they think about and care about their customers more, and they create better products and services. When we were meeting last week to talk about this, I was excited to hear that there's also a brain science explanation for the benefits of diversity. Can you talk a little bit about that? Your brain isn't modeling every single thing that's happening in the world, and, and it couldn't because there's just too much. Um, it's selecting. So there's a likelihood that if something isn't placed right in front of you, <laughs> you're not necessarily going to go searching for it. You might not be aware of what's missing. Um, and if what you're encountering just automatically makes sense to you because it's very familiar, that can feel like um, that what you're doing is right and obvious and natural. So one way that diversity um, uh, works is it introduces novelty um, to uh, uh, people, novel information that they wouldn't necessarily go searching for, them, for themselves and they wouldn't even know was available for, you know, because it, it's just not part of their experience. So they wouldn't even know. And, but there it is, it's right there. Um, and it's easily accessible. And maybe it's easily accessible by somebody who they've learned to trust. Uh, someone just put, can we get another hour, which um, I agree. But um, Dr. Barrett, thank you so much again for your time. Thanks, everyone, for, for joining in and listening. And I do look forward to talking again. Yeah, that would be great. I'd really enjoy it. Take care, everyone. We'll see you all next time.